it as well. Those of you who are from the boxing community, of course, will remember Mark as a, as a fighter. He was a, a very good fighter indeed, heavy-handed, and um, a lot of people weren't too keen about getting in, in the ring with him. He was a tough man, and he knew how to box, he knew how to fight. But in, in my opinion, for what it's worth, I think the fight that Mark has taken on since 2007, as Nick so eloquently outlined, the fight he's taken on is a very much bigger and tougher fight than anything he ever faced in the ring. And I am, well, awe is a big word, but I am in awe of what you do, of what you've taken on, and what you're now bringing to the London community. Judge Paul Worsley, who sentenced Hanad Hassan back in 2007 in the court case that you were talking about, in his summing up, he told him, Hassan that is, you deprived his family and his friends of a role model. He was a young man who was admired in the school where outside which he was murdered. He was admired as a sportsman and he was admired as an inspirational young lad who touched everybody around him. And Mark, I mean, this is a very proud day for you, but if you just throw your mind back, first of all, just give us a little bit of, a, of an idea about how horrendous that must have been for you and your family. Yeah, you come up, you come up prepared to hear that voice of that other end of the line, and then you hear your son's, one of your children's name, and you hear stabbed in the same sentence. Um, it's like it freezes your blood, it freezes your heart, it freezes every organ in your body, everything. At that moment, and then um, you, you, you start, your brain starts working. I suppose as a fighter, I start thinking, okay, let's deal with this. Be calm, you don't know, you don't have any answers to the questions, you don't know anything. Because I'm asking every question, but I'm not getting any answers. My daughter doesn't know anything. She just knows that my son's been stabbed and she's, screaming and just, so she, she's kind of trying to feel her transferred emotions coming onto me. <clears throat> and I'm, I'm trying not to get, I'm trying not to hold on to what she's feeling. I'm trying to own what's going on with me. So I try to be calm, listen to her, okay, I'll be down in a minute. I was working not far from where my daughter was. i come around and pick her up. So you begin this cycle, and I think what's really important for those that haven't read my book, The Prince of Peace, um, I would encourage you to get it, not just for sales reasons, but I would encourage you to get it because it's just an awesome book. I just open my heart up in the book, and Paul Zeller has done an awesome job uh, with me over the space of a year, putting that book together. We worked really hard. I just want to publicly thank Paul for the work we put in over that time to get that book done, um, but it basically there was a moment when I picked up my daughter and I got into the car and I said to the manufacturer of human beings, I said, save, save my son, don't let my son die. But I said that openly and my daughter could hear me. But then the, this, the little conversation hadn't ended and I said another bit, but I couldn't say it for my daughter to hear. I had to say it inside me. And I said, but if he does, and I said, I don't know where this came from, I said, but if he does, help me to accept it. I don't know where that came from. I don't know where that came from, John. But I felt like I had to say that bit. Help me to accept it, and then we started the journey. Little did I know what I was about to uh, drive to and how life was going to unfold. You, you could have gone one way or the other. I mean, I think a, a lot of people would have been broken, angry, vengeful, 
but what you've done is keep your son's name alive in the most wonderful way possible in that you've tried to carry on and do something in his name, something you believe in. Were you immediately aware that that was going to be the direction that you were going to take? No, John, you just now said the, the words that were me, broken, angry, the, the, those was, that, that was me. Um, all I could think of going to bed, waking up throughout the day was how I was going to kill this guy. That's all I was thinking about. That, it's almost like it kind of gave me a sense of, of pleasure. Like it helped me, it gave me um, a sense of being. Like so all the other feelings I had was just brokenness. But when I had this thought, I felt like, yeah, I felt empowered. Like, yeah, I'm going to do this. And it kind of juiced me up like, to keep going. Because this is what I'm going to do. But you decided to go the other way and to carry a message to the young people of London through your foundation. Yeah. How did you come to that realization that that was what you were going to do and you were going to reach so many, many thousands? Somebody told me that you reckon that you've now spoken to either directly or indirectly through, through your foundation, 84,000 youngsters, 84,000. just in London, you've been elsewhere in the country as well, speaking to youngsters, communicating with them in a way in which politicians, for all their, all their desire to put the thoughts and the emotions across so much that the legal people would like to say, but maybe can't really say, because you're a part of that community, 
you found that you were able to communicate. When did you start to realise that you were actually beginning to truly get that message across? Oh, I didn't, John. I was shitting myself when someone said, come down to the school and talk to parents and talk to kids. I was like, I don't, I don't talk to people. I knock people out. You should know why. I'm not standing up in front of crowds talking to anyone. I don't, that's not what I do. So I didn't feel comfortable. I remember being at the back of the school waiting to be called up. And my, my, my pop, I was sweating, I was dripping, and all I was doing was standing up. My mouth was dry, I couldn't even open my mouth properly. I was getting careful of water, I didn't even start speaking yet. So I was in a bad way before I began, yeah. But it was like I understood that I had to feel the fear of doing it anyway. And because my son was in the grave, it was like there was nothing that I couldn't do. There was no fear that was going to hold me down anymore. Whatever I had to do now, fear whatever, man, I'll deal with you, fear. I'll get out of there. So I walked out of there not knowing what I was going to say or what I was going to, what impact I was going to make. I had nothing prepared. Nothing. But what I'd done, I said to the manufacturer, this is you. And if this is what you want me to do, then you better put something out of my mouth when I get out of there. Because I'm going to look stupid and you're going to look stupid. So, <laughs> so I, I, walked out, I walked out there, John, on a little stage like this. And I remember all the little kids looking up at my face like this. And I remember all the parents at the back. And I just opened up and just began speaking. I just began reaching out to the hearts of the young children and remembering what I felt like when I was little and remembering what it was like for me growing up and how much harder it must be for them with all their social media and all the online stuff, all the difficulties and the pressures that they're facing now. And, and, um, and it started realizing from them that, you know, we can't look at these children and criminalize them from a young age. We, we can't do this. These are, these, are, these are kids that need the right upbringing and, and Maybe I'm here to give them this and parents would come to me after and hug me and, and be crying and said I really touched them and kids would be all around me, oh that was wonderful, you're my new role model and be getting excited and I thought, oh boy, it's something, I've done something here, you know, and, and it began, you know, the phone was ringing, people wanted me to come down and, and I've just found myself doing more of this and obviously it was, it was tough because I didn't have no means of, of living and getting on, but this was living. I, I had some, some way of feeling like I could get up and I could add value to someone's life. That meant something to me now. We, we, have, we have the problem, huge problem, which is continuing right now. There was somebody murdered in Fulham last week. 132 deaths in London last year, which is just a terrifying statistic. You're out there communicating with these kids, trying to do something about it. Where do you believe that the solution lies? The solution lies in, number one, our parents recognizing that they have the most important job on the planet.
who self-protected? Our children. Because we're thinking we need to get the latest trailers, we need to get the latest TV. And my parents never had the latest nothing. I never had the latest shoes, the latest shirts. I saw my brothers in Tashini, Lionel Scott, Farrah's, all of them too. And I never had it. I went on a school trip and I borrowed my bridges, Farrah's, and took up my trousers and changed it on the train so I could feel cool going out on the trip. But that's life. You accept it. You deal with it. And you start realising in time that there's more to life than this. And you begin to develop good character and you learn to accept that I don't have these things. You learn to accept these things. But we're living in a society where right now we want to give our kids everything. We want to make life so easy for them. We don't want our kids to go through no difficulties. But we're forgetting it's the difficulties that made you who you are today. <laughs> Toughness, struggles, develops our character. So let's stop trying to save our children from having a little bit of difficulty. They hit the floor. Okay, feel the pain. Get up, brush yourself off. Let's keep it moving. So in that area, we can make some great changes. And I could go on into the education system, John, and all that. I could listen to your noise. Absolutely. I mean, from a practical point of view, yeah. where the foundation is now in 2019, yeah. how happy are you with the way it's going? And what do you need? What can people like me and like the people who are here this evening, how can they help you? take this further than you've already got. Okay, so I've been 13 years in building, planning, visioning exactly what I want. It's clearer now, you know, just like a business. We build our businesses, corporates here. You know, you have a vision to what you want to see in the future. So our strap line is bringing people together to end violence. Look what's happened here today. Look what's happened here today, 13 years on of grafting, hard work, being ignored, doing interviews, talking to the media, being asked the same question over and over again. And look at us today. There is power in us being here, all of us, to be able to change the narrative, to be able to help make a difference with this problem. We are the solution. It starts right here. So this is a great achievement, this is a great turnaround. And look where it is. It's at the place where I've held the most pain in my life. In this same very courtroom, pacing up and down this floor. Who would have thought, I love the manufacturer of humor, he's got a wonderful sense of humor. Who would have thought he would have brought me back to this same place to feel a different sense? You guys are so important. I just want to thank you guys for being here today because maybe some of you don't understand the importance of your role here and you just thought, well, that's lovely, I'm coming down to the old Bailey. No, you, you are a strategic part of this vision to make this change. And there's powerful people, every one of you are powerful people that can make a difference. And you're here for this reason because if we don't bring people together from different demographics, to make this happen. How do we send a message out to our young people that when there's a problem for one, there's a problem for all? This is human kind. This isn't black, this isn't white, this isn't race, this isn't religion. We are human kind, we are one kind. So if I'm having a problem, it will affect you at some stage. If I'm hurting about something, it could affect you because hurting people hurt people. So if you don't help me with my hurts, I'm going to spread my disease of hurt out into your community. We are so important to each other. And if we can show that we care about each other, look at the power of that message that that gives out to our young generation who are lost and are hating and are turning that hurt and hate on each other. Mark, one, one last thing before we invite the good folk here to go downstairs and take refreshments and have a bite to eat. You can't do anything, you can't expand what you're wanting to do without material 
financial support. You've got your new inspiring future champions campaign which you're, you're putting together which is not going to be done without money. Nick alluded to it and it's something obviously which you believe passionately in but to get everything, get people involved, get sportsmen involved, some of them who are here today who I'm sure would love to be involved getting out there into the communities but in order to do that you need hard cash. Oh, straight. Um, and, and I've recognised that over all these years. So imagine, I've struggled to keep my family, looking after my family, do what I'm doing, but I've kept going. I haven't allowed lack of funds to stop me. I've still reached all these astronomical numbers of young people, and, and, and if we ever have an opportunity, you guys can see the feedback from these young people, but I've still reached them. And if I can do so much by just working with a wonderful team of people, that I've got on board, you know, John Geimer doing this bit, Jordan doing this bit, Angela, Harry, all our ambassadors, the people on our team doing great stuff, Julia, wonderful people who care and who understand the vision. If we can achieve that by just with the little that we have, what can we achieve when we all come together and we're working together? So some, like my man Anthony Yard, he's got a heart for the young people in the community. So he wants to join us and we've got a platform in reaching out to young people. We need self-evident truth. This is what works for young people. This is how you make, this is the solution. Young people want to be inspired. They don't want to hear about knife crime. They don't want to hear about gangs. Every time you equate a youth and they hear knife crime and gangs together, that's what they're built up to. They're just thinking, well, that's me. But when they start hearing about the beliefs and empowerment and inspiring and greatness and great potential, they start linking themselves to what you believe I'm great, you think I'm awesome, and then Anthony is the evidence of truth because they see their self in him. You are me. Anthony will share with them. I will share with them. They look up to us and say, yes, we want to be like these guys. This is what they need to see. That's why Inspiring Future Champions has been so powerful because they see the evidence of that truth. They're not hearing people talking, they're seeing it. We made it, we made it from the bottom and we rose, we rose above our situation. We might not be able to change the government, we might not be able to change the system, but we can change ourselves. We can change ourselves. And if we start changing ourselves and focus on that and start caring and valuing each other, our young people will pick up on that and say, look at other society around us. They care, even though the government might not be doing what they are saying they're doing, they might not be spending the money they're supposed to, but they don't control your heart and they don't control your decisions. That's in your hands, your power. And I'm, I'm asking you to make a decision to support what we're doing, to create a new narrative that we care about each other and we care about the community. If we can do it by giving monetarily, do it. If you can do it by using your skills and gifts, do it. If you can use it by just using your time, do it. Look how me and, and Nick's work together. This guy's the highest judge in the Old Bailey. Who'd ever thought that we'd be having this great relationship now? Wonderful relationship. He met me when I was a broken man. A broken man. And then we formed a relationship from there and we walked back into the gym and he had this, the, the, no, the No Lives, Better Lives program and I said, yeah, I'm willing to come on board and help with that. And, and, and we've just been, been reaching more young people. So, Judge Nick Hilliard, he's just been passionate about young people and that alone has made a difference. And this is what we're asking for everyone to do. Fantastic, Mark.